We bless you, Jesus. <laughs> we bless your holy name. We thank you, Jesus. We bless your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Good afternoon to you. Very warm welcome to our Sunday service. Thank you for joining us today. We believe that the Lord has given a very important word to share for the body of Christ, for believers. And so we just encourage you to open your heart as we go into the word today, because if you receive this today, it can make such a big impact on your life. Because we're looking today at keys to your progress towards the call of God upon your life, towards your destiny, and also key to your spiritual growth, your spiritual maturity in Christ Jesus. And I believe that all believers desire that, to progress towards the call of God and also to grow in their walk with God. And they're both linked to each other. So we're going to look at that today. So just encourage you to open your heart today and really receive what the Holy Spirit is saying to you today. Because if you can grasp this today, it can really accelerate the progress in your life and accelerate the maturity of your faith, the growth of your walk with God. So let's just open and pray and invite the Holy Spirit to really open our eyes and open our hearts to understand today. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We bless you. We magnify your name. We thank you that you are right there with everyone that is watching, that will watch. Holy Spirit, that you open their eyes to see and give them ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. It's your desire for everyone to make progress in their walk with God. Everyone to grow spiritually, to mature in Christ Jesus. That's your desire for every one of us, Lord. And I thank you for revealing how we can get to that place, Lord. So I thank you for open hearts. Let this go deep into spirits of those who listen, Lord, and that it will change their lives, that they will never forget what they hear today because it has the potential to change their lives and permanently bring transformation in their lives, Lord. So we thank you and praise you, Holy Spirit, for moving in your power, that your words of spirit and life will go deep into the hearts of all those that hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So yes, the, we're looking today at two keys that are linked to each other, and that's your progress towards your destiny, towards the call that God has for you, and also your spiritual growth, or your spiritual maturity in Christ Jesus. And we're going to look at some scriptures and some biblical examples that will help us understand this, because this really is, is essential, it's foundational, it's key. If we're ever going to achieve our destiny, we have to understand this. If we're ever going to grow in the depths of our walk with God, we have to understand this. And the reality is many believers don't understand these things that you're going to hear today. And it's why we don't see the level of progress and people going towards the type of destinies that we read about in the Bible with the Esthers, with the Josephs, with the Daniel, Moses, Abraham. We don't often hear of these great achievements of believers in these modern times. And it's because of what you're about to hear today. So if you're one who desires to make progress, no one wants to stagnate. No one wants to remain in the same place in the walk with God. Everyone should desire to get closer and closer to the call of God on a daily basis. And we can do that. And there's ways that we can do that. And many are not aware of that. And that's why the progress isn't made. And it comes hand in hand with your growth and your spiritual maturity. So we're going to look at the children of Israel, we're going to look at King Saul, we're going to look at several scriptures that will help us understand these things. And I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit really touches hearts today, because this is a type of message if we grasp, it can really transform our lives for the rest of the time that we're on this earth. It can make the difference between achieving destiny and not achieving destiny. Because there's some common misconceptions that people think regarding spiritual growth, that they think it's just a time thing. That as long as you've been a believer for a certain length of time, you'll automatically grow in the Lord. That's not the case, which we're going to see as well today when we look at the children of Israel who wandered for 40 years, basically going round in circles, but they actually made no progress. And it started because they were spiritual children instead of becoming sons and daughters and maturing in their faith and we're going to look at all that but the first scripture i want to start with today ephesians chapter 1 verse 16 17 18 around this area 
Um, so we're going to start with the scripture today because the first part we're going to look at is your growth in Christ, is your spiritual maturity. Because if we don't deal with that first, if we then talk about the second part, which is progress and destiny, it does not quite fit. And it's harder if people don't first understand this aspect of you growing in the Lord. Then when you bring the other side of the coin, which is your progress towards destiny, it's easier to understand how you can achieve that and where that fits in. So we're going to look at that first. And the first key that we're going to look at, and it's really vital that people just keep this phrase in your mind, basically for the rest of your, your spiritual walk, your walk with Christ. The key to your growth and your spiritual maturity is revelation. Revelation. Understanding what scripture says, not just reading and having knowledge, because there's scholars, there's people in the world today who know the Bible better than most born-again Christians. They could They've memorized it. They could tell you as many times as you want. They can quote any scripture. But they're not born again. They don't know Jesus and they're not transformed. Why? Knowledge puffs up. It's not enough to have the knowledge of the word of God. You have to have a revelation. The revelation is all about understanding what you're actually reading. It's about having that, we talk about the aha moment within our spirit where we go, oh, I get this. I understand this. Because it's revelation that begins to transform you. It's not enough to have knowledge because people say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We can all quote that scripture, but what does that actually mean? That's just knowledge. You then have to break that down to, okay, I can do all things through Christ. What does that mean? Well, in my life, I can do all things in, in regards to, I can be still and know that he's God. I can be still. I have a revelation that if I'm still, I will know that he's God. I have a revelation that the power of the Holy Spirit is upon my life so I can overcome challenges. I have a revelation in my life that as long as I'm walking with Christ Jesus, I can overcome any situation. I have the power. I can do all things in Christ. I have the power to turn the other cheek, bless those that curse, forgive those who have hurt me. I have the power to excel. I can do everything through Christ. I can excel in the very workplace that I am in. So it goes beyond just knowing face value what scripture is saying you have to have a revelation of that and how it applies to your life because only having the knowledge of scriptures as many people who can quote scriptures but then you look at their lives the lives do not line up with what scripture says why because you can have knowledge of the word of god but if you don't have revelation in your spirit if you don't understand what you're reading you cannot be transformed and we see this many many times that people can walk with God for many years, but if they don't actually have a revelation of what the Word of God is saying, you cannot be transformed. Your life cannot change. So revelation is vital. So this scripture here in First Ephesians chapter 1, starting from verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what the hope is, the hope of your calling, what are the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints. And it goes on to talk about how we've been seated in heavenly places and deep spiritual truths. And so we need to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in order to understand Christ, in order to understand our calling, in order to understand where we're seated in heavenly places above all the demonic spirits that are out there. These are things that you can only grasp through revelation. We can read these scriptures, but how many people have you asked them? You've been raised up and seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What does that mean to you? Most people will not be able to articulate or understand what that means. That means that when Jesus rose from the dead, he took us and seated us with him, in him, above all demonic spirits and principalities and powers. So we now have authority over them to rule and to reign. So when they begin to try to harass our lives, we know that we have power and authority over all power and authority of the enemy. You see the difference there? You can just have the knowledge of what scripture says, but you need to understand, you need to have revelation of what that means and how it applies to your life. If we don't have that, you only have the, the knowledge of the word of God. If you remember with Jesus, oftentimes he spoke in parables to people especially the religious people of his time as we know and what did he say there he said that i speak to them in parables because 
they are ever heeding but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. And this is a difference here. He then says to the disciples, but you is given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom. He then begins to explain exactly what the parables mean. The Pharisees and religious people, even of our time, those who may consider themselves as believers, but actually it's just religion. They may have a knowledge of scripture. They may go to church. They may read the Bible. They may quote scripture, all types of things. But if they don't actually have a revelation of what the word of God is saying, we wouldn't see any change in their lives. They wouldn't be able to explain the truths of scripture. And this is why Jesus was so upset with the religious people of their time because they had all these claims, they had all the religious appearance, but there was no reality, there was no substance in their lives. So he said, I will speak to them in parables, but I will speak to you and I will tell you the mysteries because it's given to you to understand these things. And I remember many years ago when I was ministering with a, a friend down in England and there were many believers who had been believers, some for decades had been believers for decades. And yet as I was ministering, the thing that the Holy Spirit kept prompting me to ask them was, do you read your Bible? How often do you read your Bible? Now you would think that is the most basic thing to ask any believer and that it's almost a thing of why do you need to ask any believer that? But I kept asking these people, and this is the type of responses, to this day it still shocks me, this is the type of responses that I was getting. Many of them said, do I need to read the Bible? Now keep in mind, these are people who have been churchgoers, some of them were even leaders in the church, for decades. This is not two or three years old Christian, these are people who have been Christians for decades. They did not know that they were supposed to read the Bible. This is what we're talking about here, that it's not about time. Time does not equate to spiritual growth or spiritual maturity. A believer or a churchgoer can be a person who claims to be a Christian for 30, 40 years, going to church all that time, yet you can have someone who is born again and in a matter of two, three, four years, they have grown way past someone who has been a Christian for 40 years. Because what people often think, and it's a common misconception that it's important that we really deal with this today so people realize it when they're examining their own lives. Time does not equate to maturity or growth spiritually. In the natural, we know that if you have a child at one or two years old, etc., they have to get to 18 before they become an adult and they can do certain things, own a house, etc., etc. That's not the way things work in the spirit. You can be 40 years a Christian and someone who's been born again for one year can be further advanced, deeper in the faith, deeper walk with Christ, more fruit in their lives than the person who's been a Christian for 40 years. That's the way it works in the spirit because it's by revelation, it's by understanding first who God is and then who you are. Now someone can go to church for, for all those decades and never have the revelation never understand these realities. This is why some of you would have heard how you're getting brand new Christians. Within months, they're seeing other people become born again. They're going out in the streets. They're praying for people. The people are being healed. They're not just praying for people. People are being healed. They are prophesying. They're giving words of knowledge. They're ministering to their friends and their friends are being born again. They've only been a believer a matter of months or years. And then you go and you check the same thing with believers who've been in church for decades and you wouldn't see one healing, never prophesied and not led a single person to Christ. And this is say this is a common misconception we, we have in the faith that just because you've been going to church for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you automatically mature, you automatically you're grown in the Lord, and automatically you understand and you have a revelation of the Word of God. Very wrong. Completely wrong. That's not how it works in the spirit. It's by revelation. You have to have an understanding. And those new believers, they come to Christ just like Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So they read the scripture. They're so hungry that they don't just accept that, okay, Jesus said, I can lay hands on the sick and they recover. Okay, I'll wait two, three, four years. I'm afraid I, I, I can't do those things. I'll wait till I'm 10, 20 years a believer, then I'll pray for the sick. Jesus says, go and preach the gospel. Okay, I'm only a few months old. I don't really understand. I'll wait till I'm decades into the faith and then I'll minister to people. These people come as little children, as Christ says. 
with simple faith of, well, Jesus says it here. I believe, he said, we will do greater works, so I'm going to go and demonstrate greater works. They will go and begin to pray for people, and Jesus honours that faith, that childlike faith. Yes, they have to grow, they have to mature, but imagine starting your faith like that. Imagine where you could go in 10, 20 years if you continue to grow at that rate. So I hope that is clarified that we all understand that it's not about time. It's not about going to church for 10, 20, 30 years and that automatically means you're deep in the faith or you've grown in Christ. Someone who's five months in Christ Jesus may easily have more knowledge, revelation, uh, relationship with Christ than someone who's five years. Or someone who's just five years in Christ can know more than someone who's 30, 40 years in Christ. Why? Because they have a revelation. Now I want to look at a, a very important biblical example here to really illustrate the importance of this revelation and that's the children of Israel. If we all look at scripture and remind ourselves of the story, they had been in bondage in Egypt for over 400 years. Hard labour, slavery, bondage, it was difficult, the Egyptians tortured them, it was a really really difficult life but then Moses was sent as a deliverer to deliver the children of Israel. Now, because they had been in bondage for so long, it became very difficult for them to get a revelation, to get an understanding of the goodness of God. Even when Moses came to deliver the message that God is going to set you free, they could not believe or accept that. To them, it, that was an alien message to them. That could not make any sense. We're in such bondage and affliction and you're coming to tell us that there's a God out there that's so good that's going to bring us out of here to a land flowing with milk and honey when every day we're suffering like this. You expect us to believe that there's a God that's so good, so powerful that he can bring us out of this place into a land flowing with milk and honey. Never. That, that cannot happen. That was the response of the children of Israel. Then as we know, they were delivered from Egypt God did mighty signs and wonders, all the plagues, we all know the stories. They were delivered from Egypt, from Pharaoh. They then come to the Red Sea. Again, they began to panic. They looked back, they saw the Egyptians coming, they began to panic, they began to complain, they said, why did you bring us here? But as we know again the story, Moses was used by God to part the Red Sea and they went through and they were delivered completely from Egypt, from Pharaoh, from the bondage. Now, the journey that they were supposed to take, this is really incredible and really illustrates what we're talking about today. The journey that they were supposed to take to the Promised Land after coming through the Red Sea, it's said to have only been 40 days or a matter of just a few months it was to take them from the other side of the Red Sea when they got through it to the Promised Land. It was only meant to take a very short period of time to get to that place. Instead, because of their disobedience, their unbelief, and the failure to understand the nature of God, which I'll emphasize in a moment, it took them 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, in the desert. This all stems from the fact that they could not get a revelation of the God that they served, of the God that they followed. They could not get this in their mind. Moses understood the mighty nature of God, the goodness of God, the power of God how God was able to take them, not just from Egypt, but all the way into the promised land. Moses had a revelation. It says Moses knows the ways of God, whereas the children of Israel only knew the works of God. Moses had a revelation of the nature of God, of who he is, his character, and understood this is easy for God to deliver from Egypt, part the Red Sea, and bring us into the promised land. He understood that. The problem was the children of Israel could not get a revelation of the goodness of of God, of the nature of God, of the power of God. And this is where the problem really is for many believers because if we don't have these two things in place, number one, a revelation of the nature of God, who God is, not just knowledge of the Bible. As I mentioned before, there's some people out there who know Genesis to Revelation better than most Christians. They can quote you, you name any book in the Bible, they will tell you every verse, yet they don't know him. It's not enough to have that knowledge. You have to have a revelation. And the children of Israel did not have a revelation of who God is. And this is a problem that we see in Christendom. Many people are following God for many years. They don't know him. They don't have a revelation of him. 
This is why I started with the scripture in Ephesians where it says, asking for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, because it takes revelation to know God. And the children of Israel did not have this revelation of who God is. They did not know he was El Shaddai, the I am that I am, the mighty God, the creator of the universe. They could not grasp that in their head to know that, okay, it's an easy thing for the God of the universe who created everything to deliver us from Egypt. It's easy for him to part the Red Sea. It's easy for him to provide manna from heaven and water from the rock and de defeat all of our enemies in the promised land. They could not get that revelation of the goodness of God and the power of God. And therefore that led to their continuous complaining, unbelief and disobedience, which we'll come to in the second part. So now we should see just how important revelation is. And it's the same thing for us today. If believers don't understand the nature of God, the goodness of God, there's believers today who don't believe that God heals. When it's all the way through scripture from the beginning to the end, and this is because people don't have a revelation of the knowledge of God, of who God is. You can read scriptures that you lay hands on the sick. They can read all about the miracles of Jesus, but they don't believe them. They don't have a revelation in their heart and their mind that God heals. If you don't have that revelation, you're not going to pray for anyone to be healed like Jesus commanded us to do. And this is a problem when you don't have a revelation of who God is. You can't obey him. You can't follow his ways if you say, I don't believe in that part. And so we see the children of Israel, they first did not have a revelation of who God is and therefore they could not have a revelation of who they are. This is the second part here about knowing God, about having revelation. If you don't have a revelation of who God is, you won't be able to understand who you are. That's our identity. First, we have to know and be confident and be established in the true nature of God. We have to have a revelation of who God is. And there, it's from there we derive our own identity. We understand that we are more than conquerors through Christ. We understand that we are overcomers. We understand we can do all things through Christ. We understand that we are loved. We understand that we've been raised up and seated in heavenly places. But these revelations and understandings only come once we have a revelation of who God is. We have to have these two things. And we cannot grow in our spiritual walk. We cannot become mature in Christ without this revelation. We must experience revelation of who God is and who we are. As we're reading the word every day, we should be asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, fill me with the spirit of revelation. Open my eyes. As it says there in scripture, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened so that you may know the hope of your calling. We have to ask for our eyes to be opened up, for understanding to come of who we are, because we can only know the call of God when we receive that revelation of who we are. So it's really vital for us in our walk with God. If we want to mature, if we want to grow in him, it's by revelation. It's not purely by reading the word of God. That's not enough. We have to ask for revelation to come from the word. That when we're reading that, understanding comes and an application comes, which is wisdom. Wisdom is simply knowledge applied. It's the wisdom of God, the spirit of wisdom upon our lives, showing us how we apply the word of God to our lives. So we need understanding to understand the word. So we get a revelation of what the word means and what is speaking to us. And then we have wisdom. How do we put that into practice? So it's really vital that we grasp these things. It's not about time. The children of Israel, they wandered around for 40 years. Were they making any progress? No. What was the problem? Immaturity. They were behaving like children. Why? Because they could not get a revelation of who God is. So the moment they came up against an obstacle, what was the first thing that they did? Oh, we should have went back to Egypt. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in the desert? They did not understand that God was so good and God was so powerful that there's no way such a good God, such a powerful God, will deliver them from Egypt the way he did, part the Red Sea, and then just leave them to die in the desert. They could not understand the goodness of God because why would God do that? God is too good and too powerful to do that. But they could not get a revelation. And as we know, we'll see in the second part, it led to them missing out completely in the destiny that God had for them. And so they continuously behave like little children, complaining, lack of belief, continuously in the desert, 
because they could not get a revelation of who God is because if they had a revelation of who God is they would have a revelation of who they are and understand that God is faithful and that when he promises people he will take them all the way to the promised land like he said he would but they could not get that understanding in them so let's shift over now to the second part that's all joined in with this which is about progress towards your destiny so first we've understood that spiritual maturity and growth is not based on time you have to receive revelation of who you are your identity and who you are in christ who god is and who you are you must receive that in order to grow in christ that's how we grow by revelation not just by reading the word or praying we have to get a revelation of who we are the authority that we have the power that we carry what we're called to do, what God has authorized us to do as believers, to bless, encourage, pray for the sick, prophesy, heal, deliver, all those types of things. We get all those things by understanding, by a revelation of who God is and who we are. Then we can walk in those things. The other side of the coin now, if we ever want to see progress towards our destiny and the calling in God, it is obedience. Again, using the same example of the children of Israel. One of the reasons that they also were disqualified from entering into the promised land was disobedience. The continuous unbelief, complaining, and they would not obey God, the, the golden calf, all those things, we know about those things, disobedience, idolatry, the sinful ways, the disobedient ways, ended up disqualifying them from the promised land. They ended up, that generation ended up dying in the desert. So you can see there, they spent 40 years going round in circles in the desert, making no progress. Just like I mentioned before, it's not about time, because if it was about time, then they've wasted time. Because 40 years for a journey that could have taken 40 days, it said, they were going round and round in circles in the wilderness. Were they making any progress? Were they any closer to the promised land? No, because it's not about time. It's about revelation. Is about understanding who God is and who we are, and then we obey from that place. And because that whole generation disobeyed God, because then came the point where the spies went to spy out the land, and they came back with an evil report. They did not believe the same thing again. They did not believe in the nature of God. They did not understand the power of God to able to deliver them from those giants that they saw in the promised land. But what did Joshua and Caleb say? They both understood and they said, no, everyone be still. We are well able. And they, they said a powerful thing. They said, those giants, those enemies in that land, their defense is gone. How did they know that those giants' defense is gone? How did they understand that? That was by revelation. They understood that, okay, if God has promised us this place and there's giants, there's other occupants here, evil, wicked occupants here, if God has promised us that, that land is ours. That means those people are automatically defeated. Those demonic beings, they're automatically defeated. The defense is gone. If God is for us, who can be against? They understood that by revelation that the defense of those ones that were occupying the land had lost already. Even before they went into the land, they had a revelation. And this again is the key. If we, we really want to know God, know who we are, it comes by revelation. If we want to make progress in our walk, it's by revelation and obedience. People will wonder why, I mentioned it earlier, why not so many believers achieve the high calling of God in Christ. Not so many believers you see are heroes of the faith or doing great exploits. We hear of the, the odd one here and there when there should be multitudes and nations all over the world that are well established that they're doing great works for the kingdom of God. And the key here and the problem that hinders them is obedience. 1 Samuel 15, 22 tells us, this is a story all about King Saul. Very important example to keep in the back of our minds regarding this aspect of obedience. Because if we want to fulfill the call of God, yes, we need to have a revelation of who God is and who we are. But we also have to come into a place of obedience. We have to be ready to follow the instructions and the voice of God on a daily basis in our lives if we want to achieve what God has called us to achieve. Because if we're disobeying God, yes, we may know who He is and know who we are, but when He's speaking and guiding us and telling us and instructing us in certain ways and we disobey, we still will not make progress and we will not fulfill our destiny. It comes through obedience. There's no way around this. This is why the children of Israel 
miss their destiny. It's through disobedience. We have to be those who delight in the law of God, delight in his commands. It's not purely about living holy and pure, but that is part of all of this obedience to God. As he says, if you love me, obey my commands. So we show our love to Christ by obeying his commands, walking in holiness and purity. But we're also talking about the day-to-day -day leadings and promptings of the Holy Spirit here. Because you can be walking in general obedience to the Lord, which is partying, drinking, violence, all the kind of obvious sins, and you're living a reasonably holy life. But if you're not obeying the voice of God, when He's given you instructions for your destiny, when He's given you instructions to make progress, for example, He says, reconcile with this person. For example, he says, apply for this job. For example, he says, connect with this person. All little instructions that the Lord is speaking into your life. If we're not hearing that and we're not obeying that, we will not make progress. Perhaps a very simple example. God has a divine connection, a friendship, someone that you're supposed to connect with. And he says, connect with this person. Because that friendship is going to connect you to your destiny. It's going to open the doors to your destiny and you refuse to connect with that person. Because of that disobedience, you could end up spending years and years in delay in your walk and your purpose with God because a divine connection that you were supposed to connect with has been missed. So we look at this here in 1 Samuel 15 verse 22. This is all about King Saul. King Saul was one of the kings, the first king of Israel before even King David. And what happened was, he had been given specific instructions by Samuel to follow because there was a battle going on with the Philistines at that time and they were supposed to go and fight a battle with the, these enemies. And Samuel, who was a, a mighty prophet of God, would give King Saul certain instructions and on this occasion he said, wait for me, when I come we will sacrifice the animals together in order to bring a sacrifice before the Lord and this will help bring us victory over the Philistines. That's the way things happened at that time. But the problem with King Saul was all of his army were getting very restless because they could see the enemy approaching and they were standing still with no battle plan. They were not ready to fight. They were just waiting because they'd been told by King Saul, don't do anything yet. We have to wait for Samuel because an instruction from the Lord has come. But King Saul became impatient and he listened to the people. Very, very dangerous thing and just something to throw in here as well. It's very, very powerful for our entire lives on this earth. But we have to get to the point in all of our lives where we choose to obey the voice of God over people. Now, this is a very hard thing. It can be a very controversial thing in our lives because there are many times when God tells us A and people tell us B. If we choose A, it's going to cause a problem with the people that we know. But we have to make a choice to obey God first. Even if it offends people, even if people fall out with us, what's the alternative? You disobey God, miss his blessings to please people. And pe the same people who one day will clap their hands for you, the next day will criticize you. You want to depend on people like that instead of the word of God, instead of following God's instruction. His word is eternal. He doesn't change. He stays the same. He is faithful. Do we go and depend on people? It's a hard thing, it's a difficult thing, it's a thing of tension in all of our lives. I know many people, we want to please people, we want to make people happy, but we need to just accept a simple bottom line of life if we're following God, if we truly want to follow God. We will have to choose many times to choose God's command, God's ways over man, and it will upset people. It's really important that you just come to terms with that. It can be hard, I've been there before, it's not an easy thing, it can be a tension, it can be a struggle, but if you ever want to fulfill the call of God in your life, if you ever want to be truly pleasing to God, you have to come to terms with that. If not, many times, you will, and you'll find out when you get to heaven, you are continuously disobeying God to please people. Oh, I don't want conflict. Oh, I don't want that person to be upset. Oh, all while, the while, you're disobeying God. You're not following His commands. So it's very, very important that we grasp this. It's a difficult thing. But if you ever want to achieve your calling God, you have to come to terms with that. You can't, as they say, you can't please everyone. So the one person you want to focus on pleasing is God. We have to choose him first. If that means some people will not be too happy with us, we have to come to terms with that. 
that's not about being rude to people, as I always say when you're dealing with that. We don't have to be rude about it. But we have to come to terms with that. If not, you cannot expect to fulfill the call of God in your life. Because God can only trust people in high positions of influence when they're ready to choose God over man. Especially as you become more popular and influential, more people will be pulling you in the opposite direction of God. More people will say, can you do this? Can you do that? And God is saying, no, do not go near that. You go near that, you're going to be distracted. And there's actually a trap to expose you in there. That's the type of things that can happen when you begin to rise in God. And so it's important that you just come to terms. It's a hard thing. It can cause tension. But you have to come to terms with the reality that if you really want to obey God, there's times where people will be offended and be upset. In very simple terms, as I used to tell young people, when they became born again and they stopped drinking, partying, drugs, all those type of things, they had to walk away from some friends because the friends used to bully them, insult them, say, why are you not drinking? Why are you not taking drugs? You used to do this. You, you just you have to upset them. What choice do you have? You go back to sin. You go back to pleasing your friends. Go back to drugs, alcohol. Why? To please people when God is the opposite way, to give a simple example to illustrate what we're saying. So we pick the story up here again. King Saul has a simple choice. He can obey the army of restless people who can see the enemy coming and they're thinking, uh oh, we're going to be destroyed. We're standing here, no instruction has been given to protect, to defend, to fight, nothing. All we've been told by King Saul is stand and wait till I tell you. King Saul is now being pressured by the people Exactly what I was saying there. Pressured. King Saul, you need to do something. The enemy's coming. You need to do something. Go and sacrifice. If you said you're going to sacrifice and then we go to war, just go and sacrifice. Do you know what he did? He listened to the people. He sacrificed the animals and he lost absolutely everything. It's one of the most horrific examples in the whole Bible. It's one of the worst stories in the whole Bible. It's one that we should all remember if we ever need biblical illustration of the dangers of pleasing people over God. There it is. He ended up losing his life, his kingship, and his walk with God. He lost everything. Because then, after he then sacrificed the animals and started to do things on his own accord, Samuel then arrives and Samuel had told him, Do not move. Excuse me. Samuel had told them, Do not move. Do not do anything until I arrive. Do not sacrifice until I arrive. And so we pick up here, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Samuel said to Saul, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Saul tried to explain it away and excuse away his actions by saying, the people were putting pressure on me you delayed. I didn't know if you were still going to be here. So I just sacrificed. And then Samuel arrives and says, what is this mistake that you have done? You have went and disobeyed the voice of the Lord. And he says to obey is better than sacrifice. He then ended up losing everything, King Saul, because he disobeyed God to please man. So if we truly want to fulfill the call of God, if we want to make progress, if we want to get closer to the call of God in our lives, we have to make a choice that God, I'm going to obey you first. I'm going to put you first over anybody else. You are first place. Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, everything. We're supposed to put him first, our first love. Obey him and put him first above all things. And when we do that, then that triggers the chain of events that open up the door for God's blessings, God's progress in our life, and ultimately the destiny that God has for us. So just to encourage people, just in a reminder as we, we, we close now. If you want to grow in the Lord, if you want to become spiritually mature in Christ Jesus, it's not based on time. Time alone is not enough. Just going to church or reading the Bible, no. You have to, through your relationship and walk with Jesus, you must receive revelation, more and more revelation, as we read in the beginning. Spirit of wisdom and revelation to grow in the knowledge of Him and your calling. We have to grow in a revelation of who God is and who we are. And then, the other side of the coin that's just as essential, it has to come with obedience. Day-to-day -day walking with the Holy Spirit. Saying, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? What are you doing? What's your instruction? How should I respond to this situation? 
Do I turn the other cheek? Do I go the extra mile? Do I go to this place? Do I connect with this person? As the scripture says, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. If we listen out to the voice of the Spirit, if we have ears to hear, eyes to see, the Holy Spirit will guide us on a daily basis, give us instructions, and when we obey these instructions, we make progress. That's how you make progress towards your destiny and your call, because revelation of who God is and who you are, and revelation of His instructions for your life, when those things are then obeyed, you then make progress, you then make advancement in what God is calling you to do. If we don't have revelation of who God is, we can continue on as believers for year after year after year, and no progress has been made, no deeper revelation, no deeper walk with Christ, and then we're not hearing Him and obeying Him. And this is why many don't achieve the high calling of God. Many don't get to the great places that God wants to take them because of these things. Okay, just going to close in prayer now. Just encourage you in this moment, just now as we, we pause to reflect for a moment. Just encourage you in this moment now, just to allow the Holy Spirit to speak into your heart, to bring revelation, to let this word go deep, but also to bring revelation. And is there any instructions, any things that you know the Holy Spirit has been speaking into your life and said, do this, do that, this is the way to go, this is what the scripture is saying over your life. I just want to give people a moment before we close in prayer just to contemplate and meditate over what has been shared today. Holy Spirit, we just thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, you're present with all those who are watching and will watch, Lord. We thank you for touching their lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing fresh revelation, for filling them with the spirit of wisdom and revelation, giving them fresh revelation of who you are and who they are, that they may grow in their walk with you, and that you would give them the spirit of obedience, a heart of obedience, that they would delight in your ways, Lord, delight in your laws and your commands, so that they can make progress every day of their life towards the high calling of God for their life. Lord Jesus, have mercy upon us when we fall short, Lord. Holy Spirit, prompt us when we need prompting in your ways and guidance in your ways. And fresh revelation, Lord, if it's in our dreams, visions, and our waking life, Lord Jesus, that you speak to us and that we can understand what you're saying to us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you've been blessed. I just encourage you to spend some time reflecting on, meditating on this, praying into this, asking for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to fill you in the knowledge of God so you get fresh revelation of who he is and to walk in obedience to his instructions. Next week we're meeting at half past six in the Thornhill Community Hall for a, a special kingdom gathering in case you can join us for that. Okay, thank you for joining us again. Have a blessed and a wonderful week. God bless.